Hello and a happy new year and welcome to this, the second edition of Path to Power, our first of 2024 with me, Matt Cooper. And me, Ivan Yates. And if you're wondering about the name of the podcast, Path to Power, it was chosen because this is the year of elections to bring people and parties to power to govern. We'll definitively have local European Uderos elections in June, but I honestly believe we'll have a general election as a consequence of that, if or not before uh, that. We'll get to all of that. If you're new to the podcast, well, we did our first in the middle of December, setting out our opinions about what happened in Irish politics during 2023. What we're going to do today is turn our attention to three key people in Irish politics. The Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, the Thonish de Michal Martin and the leader of the opposition, Mary Lou Macdonald. Now, there's no offence to anyone else, but these are the three people in contention for being our next Taoiseach. But before we talk about those individuals in turn, Ivan, I want to ask you about the importance of a party leader in appealing to the electorate as a potential Taoiseach, in emphasising the brand of the party by dictating policy, by helping other party members to secure their votes, in ordering and maintaining party discipline, particularly as people look for advancement within the party. Am I missing anything there from the role of the well, party I, leader? I, well, I, you're absolutely right in terms of the face on the poster, the, the brand image, what can it be reduced to in a soundbite. But I, I would just say I was in eight different dolls. And everyone who goes into the doll as a shiny new TD is ambitious. They wouldn't be there unless they wanted to get to the top. But I think the defining thing of leaders is they have that extra killer instinct, that extra resilience. And I've noticed this and I can sort of describe it that, you know, they didn't want any other career. Like I faced a situation, you know, after the co- green, the Rainbow Coalition, uh, whereby I was being speculated as a leader and actually decided I've done 20 years in the door. I want to do something else with my life. But if you look at Alan Jukes, if you look at uh, Charlie Hawhey, if you look at Bertie Ahern and so on, they really had one drive in life and that sets them apart. Well, go through for me, before we get to any of our three subjects today, the party leaders that you served and what was good and what was bad about them, if your memory goes back that far, to Gareth Fitzgerald, Alan Jukes, John Bruton, Michael Noonan. They were the four you served. Well, first of all, as you you get older, you become more cynical and world weary. So Gareth Fitzgerald was my idol. One of the reasons I joined Fine Gael was he was my idol. He was just, he was very charismatic. The whole of politics was defined as Charlie the Bad versus Gareth the Good. He was ahead of his time. He believed that 900 unionists should not uh, be told to join a United Ireland without their consent, which is a big difference to the high position. The Constitutional Crusade, you know, a divorce referendum. He was ahead of his time. Liberal Ireland came later, but he did it when it was neither fashionable nor popular. He was saying we should have divorce in this country. We, he, the, the Spock Amendment, which was banning abortion, was completely against his instincts. He, he, he left Aer Lingus and the legend was that it took 16 computers and a whole raft of staff to replace him. He was a, he was a statistician. He was a wizard. And did he, he have that drive though? Was he the sort of one that's ruthless politicians that you seem to admire. Oh, uh, I mean, I once asked Sean O'Rourke who was the most ruthless politician he ever interviewed and he said, without doubt, Gareth Fitzgerald. He had this fuzzy, avuncular academic image but behind it, him and Peter Brendergast were the most ruthless. When I was going for my first convention, barely 21 years of age to be eligible for the doll and I just got into the Urban Council, no pedigree in Enniscorthy, they decided they wanted young Yates and to shaft the existing uh, senators and all of that. So he was absolutely ruthless. Do you remember the national handlers? Then we move on to Alan Jukes. So it's a bit like Alex Ferguson. Whoever comes after a legend in his own lifetime, Garrett, was going to be an impossible job. So you know, Alan Jukes was the David Moyes. Yeah, absolutely. That? Absolutely. And, 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 and all of that. So it was a hiding to nothing, but it was very divided because uh, Alan Jukes only just won all oh, the entire cabinet after the Fitzgerald administration supporter Peter Barry. And rightly or wrongly, it became into, Alan was always looking over his shoulder. I liked Alan personally a lot, but actually he would have made a better Secretary General, Secretary to the Cabinet, civil servant, a technocrat. He came from Brussels and that kind of thing. He he didn't do the arm around you, the lovey-dovey, charmy, schmoozy stuff at all. And that came against him. What about John Bruton then, who did become Taoiseach? And, and appointed me to the Cabinet. So obviously... We I won't was, hold that against exactly, him. <laughs> exactly, his crimes against humanity. But the, the point about it is that... Uh, 
John went straight from college into the door. A raw recruit in Meath and got in. Was from a sort of landed gentry, Bruton family background, sort of big ranch farmers in Meath. That's why he appointed you, was he and saw a bit no, of himself in well, you, was he, it? No, no, he was allowed to be painted I'm, I believe, unfairly, as a very ideological person. Because in the Fitzgerald administration, when he was Minister of Finance, he had ongoing spats over public finances. And you remember, the 80s were a very difficult time, yeah. recession of that, with Dick Spring and with others. And, and so he was he was labelled as very right-wing. I would say religion mattered to him and his wife, and he was quite conservative, which I wasn't on that side of the house. Alan Dukes was very much a, a liberal. But I would say that he actually epitomises what I said about a leader. His whole life was consumed by politics. After he left politics, he was only interested in European and public affairs. He was absolutely committed to Europe. He believed in all that great stuff and uh, he, he was a Europhile. So what I would say about John is that he was very much more a chairman than a chief executive because he was handling Prunchies de Ross or Dick Spring. So there are two styles. So there's the Hohi style, which is, I'm the CEO, this is the way, and Albert Reynolds is the same. It's my way or the highway. I mean, Dick Spring says about Albert Reynolds, his idea of consultation was telling you what he was going to do. Uh, Bruton was, Bruton took the view and, and I'll just to wrap it up on this. In the very first week, he said, our philosophy is the better the government does as a cohesive unit, because we're the biggest party, the better Fine Gael will do in the next election. So his whole strategy was, Dick, how high do you want me to jump? Well, I'll come back to that in a little while because it might be relevant to our discussion about Leo Varadkar. But before we get to that, Michael Noonan, of course, was the leader who had the worst performance imaginable. 31 seats in 2002. The election on the Friday by Saturday night, he was on national television resigning. But could it be that Leo Varadkar is going to have a worse outcome in the forthcoming general election, a disastrous 2020 general election in which he won only 35 seats for Fine Gael, it could be less than 31, less than Noonan's Nadir. The final point, uh, the, the camel that broke, the, the straw that broke the camel's back for me leaving politics in 2001 was upon his election. Within a week I announced in 2001 I was leaving. I have to say, I really respected his ministerial performance, but I felt he was not a leader. I actually felt that all the heaves in Fine Gael against Dukes, against Bruton, were all ultimately a situation where we're going to keep heaving until he's leader and him and Jim Mitchell and they came up with some daft things like, you know, subsidising taxi plates or whatever. <laughs> so put it like this, I'm not his greatest fan. I think he went on to be a very good Minister of Finance after the Troika and all that. But put it like this, uh, we just never seemed to be on the right side. I was always defending the leader and, and he was always against it. But you're absolutely right. That is the Nadir of Fine Gael. They got the lowest number of seats. Uh, you tell me how many was? 31. Well, yeah, on 18% of the vote. Yes, absolutely, uh, that could go lower. Uh, they might could get, go lower in a bigger dial where there are more seats yeah, to Percentage-wise, it could go lower. Yeah. Seats-wise, it could be broadly similar. Okay. So, you mentioned about John Bruton as a sort of a chairman. So, let's get to our three party leaders who are the subject of this edition of Path to Power. And let's start with the Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar. And is he trying to emulate John Bruton in that sort of chairman style as Taoiseach, do you think? Well, first of all, I, I need to preempt what I'm going to say by saying that, look, it's very fashionable that to be totally cynical about politics and politicians, there's something that you wipe off your shoe, they're all on the make and so on. I actually, having been before the electors, knowing the sort of human toll, I'm actually going to say some nasty things about them, but I actually don't mean to be nasty insofar as I have a deep respect for anyone who gets to the top of the greasy pole. You have to have exceptional skills and there's lots of good people who've never been leaders. Um, Leo, well, the first thing about him is I, I think his intellect is very sharp. I think that he reads the briefs, he understands it, he gets it, but he lets everyone know that he's the sharpest tool in the shed. And therefore, he has an abrasive uh, aspect of his character, uh, which means he doesn't suffer fools gladly. Whereas, you know, a lot of leaders, like oh, he didn't suffer fools gladly, but he indulged them. You know what I mean? And one of the most interesting... If they were useful to him. Absolutely. And loyal I, to him. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and uh, 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 so for Leo... I think the most telling thing about him is that I remember pre-2016 when he took over the leadership of the party. 2017. Yeah, yeah but, but in this, sort of in the long grass, what was happening? He put together 
and was part of this thing called a Gang of Five. So it was people like Owen Murphy, who went on to be housing minister, left politics. John Paul Phelan, leaving politics. Michael Darcy, left politics. Now, these people didn't lose their seats. Uh, and now we have uh, Deputy Griffin in, in Kerry. So the thing about Leo is... Does he really have relationships? Does he really have friendships? Are you his best friend or are you the stepping stone to his next move up the career ladder? Okay, but something else that strikes me, when he won the Fine Gael party leadership in 2017, he won it by a sort of a parliamentary party coup. He managed Mm -hmm. to get them on site in sufficient number to make the party membership almost irrelevant. But what was striking at the time was, was that Simon Coveney actually thumped him when it came to the party membership. And the belief at the time seemed to be that the TDs knew who would get them elected at the subsequent election. They reckoned that Leo Varadkar had this incredible marketability. You put his face on posters, that would help them all get elected. And it turned out in the 2019 European and local elections not to be the case, and even worse in the 2020 election. So did the parliamentary party misread his ability to connect with the electorate? Well, first of all, whether it's in Britain or elsewhere, I actually believe that the people whose own re-election depends on it should have the say. I think party activists are often not the best people in any party. So I I favour that hierarchical, you could say anti-democratic position. Look, ifs and buts and maybes in terms of Simon Coveney, I I, I actually don't think outside of Cork that Simon Coveney would have done any better. Uh, I honestly believe in this day and age you need a Dublin leader. And I think he was that. I think he he was perceived to be younger and brighter. And, and and that's the first point I come to in terms of substance about his performance as party leader. I think he was much better first time around. You absolutely felt the energy of him, you know, in Washington, the drama of the yeah, lockdown. Hold on, but hold on. That was after the 2020 general election yeah. that he almost came into his own as the COVID Taoiseach, when he had to make the big statements to reassure the country and the majority of people went with it. But only a few months earlier, when it had come to the hustings in relation to winning the election, he had, to all intents and purposes, failed. He was there as a caretaker while they were sorting out a new government with Fianna Fáil and with the Greens, which came into place in the middle of 2020. So his best period was then. And that might have given Fine Gael a lot of hope that when he returned to power at the end of 2022 as Taoiseach, he would then make the big impact. Where has the big impact been? There well, doesn't seem well, to have been well, any. Just, Sorry, I'm just wondering, yeah, the yes? only thing that the straight-talking Leo has really come out on, and the straight-talking that he sort of catapulted his way mm. forward was the Morris McCabe situation, mm-hmm. where he went against the political conventional wisdom, correctly identified what the public was thinking. He has been very strong in his condemnation of Israel's activities mm. in Gaza, much stronger than almost any other European Union leader. But why aren't we getting that strength and follow through in domestic politics. Well, well, first of all, to take your point about the 2020 election, look, what what it said on the tin for Leo was, when I'm Minister for Social Protection, I'm going to deal with fraud. You know, he wasn't ev- em- showing empathy for people who were on the poverty line. When, when sorry, it came, isn't that all with Fine Gael supporters? Well, no, 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 to sorry, a good ab- kicking no, no, he, to those who aren't paying their own no, way. No, no, so any fudge at the edges of the Fine Gael image. He actually crystallised it into a middle-class party. He never had much sympathy for the farmers and so on. So, A, he gave, the upside was, he gave solid definition to an element of the market share, but that was smaller than the kind of catch-all that, say, Micheál Martin might go for, not being clearly defined, not being clearly labelled. So, you remember, his first statement was, when he was elected Taoiseach, I'm for those who get up early in the morning. I'm for people who work hard. I'm for a mirror autocracy and all of that. And I think it's nice and it's a good thing if politicians are honest and straight and say, this is what I really feel. It's just disappointing that ever since he hasn't done anything about those things. Could, is it possible to do those things though in a coalition government with Fianna Fáil and the Greens? Or could it be that he should have tried to stake out more on that rather than allowing Pascal Donoghue to spend an enormous amount of money? Something that has upset some members of the Fine Gael Parliamentary Party. I think two of those who were going would have been very critical along the way, Charlie Flanagan and Michael Creed, for example, that the discipline that they expected of Fine Gael, that is one of its selling points as conservative fiscally, had been lost in recent years. Yeah, there's no doubt for me that that Leo uh, had a kind of co-leadership style 
which involved two other people, Simon Coveney and especially Pascal Donoghue, who is was his most visible early declaring supporter. And I think they're, 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 they were elected similar times to the Dáil. They were of the same generation uh, and, and so on. But, so I would say on the plus side for Leo, I think his communication skills are good. He can reduce a complex argument to a, a good soundbite. I think he's he, he, he gets it on a lot of issues. He has maintained reasonable party unity, which is one of the key uh, functions of a leader. Now, he hasn't been Despite able to... Despite the fact that he's losing so that, many. No, sorry. They, a, no. a, eight TDs who are not standing for re-election. Now, you could say... No, but none of them are leaving because of a policy stance. They're leaving because they're no longer on the inside career track with Leo. OK, now, but is that his fault in that he didn't have many baubles to distribute, given that when you're in a coalition government, you only have so many cabinet seats, you have only so many junior ministries? Or was he perhaps I a think little he lost too touch, conservative? He lost touch with some of the people on a personal one-to-one. They thought they were a lot closer to him in the hugger mugger of undermining Kenny and getting you know the, the the numbers in the parliamentary party. So, do they feel used by him? Yes, absolutely. And like, uh, but isn't I, that the nature of politics? Everybody everyone gets used the condom. Top. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, that's definitely not what I'm saying. <laughs> I strike that analogy anyway. Jeez. <laughs> no, so so, so what I, what I would say in favour of, of of Leo is that. Um, he also suffers from the fact, right, and this, this, you've got to give some credit for this, that the difficulty of Fine Gael is they won 76 seats in 2011. That was unsustainable. The whole mantra from Phil Hogan, Director of Elections, was lend us your vote. But there's a country's in crisis. Fianna Fáil went down to 19 seats. It was never sustainable that the party would re-elect that. It was a case of damage limitation. And I think going into the next election, looking for a fourth term, it's more the same. So can you pin that on, uh, uh, you know, Richie Sunak? Can you pin that on the incumbent? The fact of the matter is the tide is going out. Well, do you think is Leo Varadkar tired in some respects in that he has been in government consistently since 2011? He was Taoiseach between 2017 and 2020. Then he was a spell as Taunashta. Now he's back as Taoiseach again. Do you think as maybe, you know, he's had the achievements that he oversaw, for example, the winning of the abortion referendum, although many others will claim credit for that as well, that maybe he just is worn out, he's done, that there's other things in life. Well, that's what I meant about a low boredom threshold. So the first thing, if I'm... You walk into me and you say, I'm, I want to be CEO of the PLC. If you walk into me and say, I want to be a senior counsel, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, what age are you, Matt? You know, and so far as, and the thing that I think is most striking about the basic fact of the three leaders, Leo is 44, Mary Lou is 54, and Michal will be 64 on the 1st of uh, uh, August next. And I believe everyone is on a life journey. You're, what you do in your 30s, 40s and 60s are different, irrespective of the circumstances. And I think you're absolutely right. I think he's gone as high as he can go in Irish politics. He's done the top gigs. He's done the top ministries. He's had effectively 13 consecutive years in cabinet. And I actually watch Leo and I observe him. What gets him exercised? When he goes to Brussels, when he goes to the UN, he is absolutely fired up and passionate, the old Leo, about supporting Ukraine, about taking in refugees, about some world issues on sustainability and so on. And I'm saying to myself, is he actually auditioning for his next well, international on. job? Does that mean that perhaps that his objections to Pascal Dunne, who going off to the IMF, <laughs> are motivated by jealousy and envy? That Pascal Dunne, who might be about to get the type of job that Leo Varadkar would have wanted for himself? Well, I, I, I have been privately saying for two years that I, I sense, and this is an outrageous thing to say, but I actually believe it, that both Simon Coveney, uh, Pascal and Leo have been saying you know, I'm really looking not to being a backbencher in opposition for the next four years after the general election. I'm looking at my next career move. And I think any of them, if they were offered a plum, EU, uh, UN, WHO, or any international stage job, they would, or the IMF, would they take it in a heartbeat? Well then, does that suggest that Fine Gael have missed a trick in not changing the leader in advance of the forthcoming general election. Now, it would be unprecedented, I suppose, to dump a sitting Taoiseach if there wasn't a major scandal or a major health issue or something like that. But I heard last summer there were mutterings Mm. in some parts of Fine Gael. After a number of things, particularly, actually, this might seem like a bizarre one, but an awful lot of Fine Gael people were embarrassed by the Matt Barrett 
Instagram commentary from the coronation of King Charles, thinking that was a very inappropriate way. And the, the video and the George wouldn't have helped either. Yeah, and they regard it certainly in relation to the the coronation, that inappropriate way to be behaving. And there were some of them saying, look, would we be better off persuading him to go and put somebody new and fresh like a Simon Harris mm. or a Helen McEntee or somebody like that in, uh, potentially as a first female Taoiseach to contract Mary Lou Macdonald? It never happened. He's managed to stymie any Yeah, I know. I've no doubt late. that Simon Harris was on manoeuvres, as they call it, uh, in terms of uh, checking out the options, what the numbers were like. But would that have been the right thing for Fine Gael to uh, do? Well, put it like this, uh, the, the situation is in all of those uh, opportunity assessments, uh, and I think Michael McGrath made the same assessment about Micheál Martin. You know what? I'm going to pick up the leadership of the party after the next election anyway. Why do I need the strife, the war, the internal uh, divisions that would arise? You know what? Lisa at easy mended. Okay, so we we'll get I mean, to whether it's the right thing for Finnegan. We never know. We'll get to Micheál Martin in a minute, but just summarise to finish with Leo Varadkar. Are we sort of coming to a conclusion? Is is that? Fine Gael are bunched for the next election under the leadership of Varadkar because they've been in power for or too long. Or any leadership? Or, well, they've been in power for too long and Varadkar has been there for too long. Well, put, put it like this. I, I actually think I would give Varadkar 8 out of 10. I think he's been a good Taoiseach. He's been very competent. Uh, there have been wobbles along the way. You've referred to them. The 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 the, the, the London incident, uh, the leaking of the Garda, sorry, the GP contract, and all of those kind of things. But uh, sorry, I wonder how much the public really cared yeah, about that. that. Right. But, but, but his hand hasn't been in the till. His integrity is intact. But can he pull it out of the fire in 2024? Can we get a newly fired up Leo Varadkar who will maybe deal with issues domestically with the type of strength he shows in relation to Israel and maybe can do it rather than just maybe keeping all of his comments for bashing Sinn Féin? Well, I think the most interesting thing about Leo is that Leo has sussed the situation the situation is one of damage limitation and he would like to gazumption Fein to not have populated next doll election with new shiny poll topping councillors and he would like to go for an early election. And I think he's the most savvy tactical thinker in the cabinet about that. And I think the other parties haven't even begun to realise the situation. I think he's a realist, ultimately. But I, I put it like this. I, 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 The other thing, I was introducing Leo at a conference the other day and I said, he's one of the most resilient people that I've ever met in any walk of life. Like, he just keeps going. You know, he's had a lot of criticism and he already turned around and he said, he said, actually, sometimes you don't have a choice about being resilient. You just have to get on with it. And you know, and just uh, to complete our discussion about Leo Varadkar, something he said in recent days, which I would respect him for, is that despite the fact that he's been the target of some pretty nasty stuff online and even graffiti from the likes of people who are racist and homophobic, he has said he mm. will continue to live his life as he lives it. He's not going to take additional security measures. He's not going to stop going out, which I think is very, very yeah. important. I think you put your finger on the right word there. The, the hallmark for me of whether you support Fine Gael or don't is Leo as Taoiseach deserves our respect. We don't love him. We don't like him necessarily, uh, but we do respect him. And I'll tell you one other thing, just as you mentioned about you think that he's been... And I'm not going to use the four-letter word that we said we would have a 20 euro ban for him in the swear jar. But when it came to Ukraine, I mean, he put his money where his mouth is. He took in mm, somebody yeah. from Ukraine who's been living in the house with himself and Matt. And I mean, I'm not sure President Michael D. Higgins has taken refugees into the Auris, has he? <laughs> That's a low, a low <laughs> blow there. <laughs> no, no podcast would be complete without one of us having a dig at Michael D. Uh, let's talk about Michal Martin, because a lot of political commentators were saying that he may have been the politician of the year of 2023. What's your assessment of how he has done since enduring the disappointment of giving up his long sought after role of Taoiseach to become Taunasha? And what do you reckon his chances are of becoming Taoiseach again? Well, first of all, you know, I, I, I'm trying to paint a, a, a scenario of where I think Leo is headed. And I think for, for me, Hall, a couple of things. Um, he actually was in the, in the doll. In 87, in my era, 
He's a minister. He's that old. Yeah, and absolutely. <laughs> he's he's been a minister since ninety seven. He's held a number of different portfolios, and he's been party leader since twenty eleven. In fact, he was central to the Bertie era, which is anathema to young people. And 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 so therefore, I actually think you cannot look at Hall as if he was forty four. He's not, and so he's sixty four. But is he not the eternally youthful politician in that? He has the benefit, yes, of all the many years of experience and maturity that comes with it, but he still seems to have a drive and an energy yeah. that would put people a decade, two decades, even three decades younger to shame. Yeah, but 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 for some people, you just don't get past the word Bertie without you know be- becoming abusive. So I think I think he he suffers from that. So the credits that I would give to him, I've tried to give credits to, to Leo and to first of all. I actually think he'd make a great president. A, he was seen as a fair-minded Taoiseach, more in the chairman than the CEO role of, you know, keeping it, it, you know, this was a new venture. We never did rotating Taoiseach before and he kept it between the ditches. Secondly, he has got a bit of this, and you would know this in Cork, where having grown up there, a bit of the Jack Lynch about him insofar as he, he is... He's very hard to dislike. He has the GAA DNA, you know, and his son is a goalie and all that kind of thing. And he's kind of got that down-to-earth appeal. Sorry, can I stop you there for a minute? I just want to tell you a little anecdote about him. Something I observed the summer before last. Down in Cork, my old rugby club Sunday as well, has very actively involved in... Uh, mixed ability. Here was I rate. thinking you were a goalie for a GA club, I but was, it's your I Sunday was as well. well. <laughs> I, don't, I was that. I played goalkeeper for Bishop's Town as You're as promiscuous as, well. as anyone when it Absolute comes to sport. Word. I've played a lot of sport. <laughs> anyway, the point is we had this Rugby World Cup, mixed ability World Cup for people with intellectual uh, disabilities mixed in with able-bodied and it was a wonderful tournament in Cork. 13 countries represented down in Cork. Opening ceremony on a lashing When rain. was this? This was the summer of 2022. Well, very recently, yeah. yeah. So I was the MC for the event and we had, in the pouring rain, was well, 6,000 Because you do three effort. gigs, don't you? Unlike you, yeah, Ivan, absolutely. yes, I do, for charities and sporting <laughs> organisations. I don't, I don't speak Latin, I don't anyway. do pro bono. <laughs> anyway, Michal Martin came to it, Michael McGrath came to it, Simon Coveney came to it. The vast majority of the people who were there were from all the countries around the world. It was the families and supporters of the teams. Michal Martin went around for hours introducing himself, talking. There were no votes to be mm-hmm. won on it. Nothing. Because no, he's, he's a decent first. fella. He was just... A, no, no, I have to say Michael McGrath as well apparently went to a number of the matches during the week quietly. But himself and Simon Coveney were limited in their interactions with people. Michal Martin just seemed to lap it up when he went around. Now, there are a couple of things I'd say out of that. One was that it was just, you could see it was his innate generosity as a person, which I think has appealed to a lot of people in his time as Taoiseach that they've liked his approach to doing things. It also would strike me that it's very presidential, as you said, mm-hmm. that it could be that... Hard to dislike. Uh, yeah, but there'd be one major drawback from it being president. I mean, you can't be in Cork while you're president living out of the Auras. He is a guy, yes, he has his apartment in Dublin and he spends his time in Dublin, but he's at home in Cork on the weekends. I can't imagine... Well, it's obviously when it came to a choice of moving to live in Brussels to be the next EU commissioner, he'd rather live in Dublin than Cork. Uh, sorry, live in Cork and Dublin rather yeah. than, than be there. Uh, so, put it like this. I also think... There is a uh, kind of awareness in the public that he's had terrible tragedy in his family with deaths and so on. And actually, you know, you know, I described the killer instinct and the ultimate ruthlessness of leaders. He, he may have it, but he doesn't show it. He conceals it very well. Oh, he's quite so? humanist. Hold on, did he not? I mean, he got rid of two of his ministers in quick order, Barry Cohn and Derek Cleary. Maybe they were circumstantial. He did appoint them in so far as that golf and gate he and... ruthlessly got rid of them. No, he did. He did. But put it like this. One of the things of a leader is, is, is they're actually your boss as well as everything else. They hire and fire. And, you know, there, there was always a thing that John Bruton said. You've got to have one body between you and the door when there's trouble, right? And so if that body goes under, you know what I mean? You keep the trouble away. Yeah, but hold on. He's so t- jettisoning he's- people is part of the job. He came to the leadership, it'll be 13 years ago next, this month, I think, mm-hmm, or next month. Mm-hmm. And he has and saved st- Fianna Fáil from a near-death yes. experience. And there's been lots of grumbling and rumbling against him, but he has been unchallenged. Yes. And you actually look at it, and you mentioned Michael McGrath, but, you know, as Michael McGrath got the charisma of Michal Martin to actually lead the party, that said, the other issue is, you look at the popularity personally of Michal Martin, 
it's not reflected in the Fianna Fáil vote in the opinion polls. Well, actually, well, that's the biggest argument of, of people who believe that he should go on in perpetuity. They're saying Mihol's popularity is much greater. It's a multiple of what the party is. But I think that's actually true of, of all leaders. So my, my, my first point about him is he actually needs to work out how long his political career is going to last. I think there's one other significant difference. Mihol Martin as leader of Fianna Fáil, and the question of going to government with Sinn Féin. It is a different question if there's a different leader. He has dedicated most of his political capital, ammunition and everything into absolutely sincerely hating the ground that Sinn Féin walk on. For, and his whole approach to Northern Ireland has been one of reconciliation rather than border poles, and he actually really believes that. The other interesting thing I want to say about him is this. Usually when you go to a party leader, you can identify the junior ministers, the senior ministers, the backbenchers that are loyalists. When you speak to Fianna Fáil backbench TDs, you actually find it's Deirdre Galan, it's McPartland and it's Sean Dorgan are his key advisors. They and are people, not elected people. Yeah. These are the people who would not be known to the vast majority Absolutely. of the And they're, they're technocrats and they've done a good job and all the rest of it. But he actually doesn't confide and ring up backbenchers and say, what do you think we should do about this? And in some cases, like you take in fairness That's to That's why him, he lost Moynihan and Cork, Lord said... Cork North West, for yeah. example. And when, he did, when, he did, when he didn't give him... Well, he's still in the parliamentary party, but he lost him as a loyalist. And, 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 and two, two of the stances he took on the referendums on abortion uh, and, and other issues, marriage equality, he actually you know, made a personal statement at the door and, and actually took risks about that. That didn't come from looking into the soul. Remember, there was a whole country in Western... Remember the big photo of Fianna Fáil backbenchers who were against the referendum? He, he, he actually has shown a lot of courage. But I, I just think the miles on the clock are Michal's biggest yeah, problem. I suspect he has no intention of resigning. I think he's a man who is so wedded to politics and has lived it for so long. A brief period as a teacher before he entered the Doyle. I think he's the type of guy who probably sees himself going for another six, seven, even ten years. OK, well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way I'm not saying that he should I'm just yeah, no, my yeah, no. feeling sorry, is, is that the way he thinks there's nothing that I've heard from those closest to him that would indicate any different but the fact is I think throughout life you've got to show a little bit of self-awareness when did you ever show self awareness? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Might have liked what a conclusion I came to. So, so I mean, like one of the things that he's going around saying is, "Oh, this government is going to be re-elected because the sum of the parts add up to forty percent, and Sinn Fein is less than forty percent." Sorry. Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil could be going in opposite directions coming out of this government. This government could actually unravel. They may not have a thing because I think the future direction of Fine Gael is to actually rebuild an opposition. OK. It could be that Fianna Fáil ends up going into power with Sinn Féin. You say that... They that won't happen under Michal. Right. OK, that's an interesting point. But here's another one for you. I mean, some of the other senior Fianna Fáil people have been pretty strong recently as well. The likes of Dara O'Brien, Jack Chambers, saying they don't see it happening either. They don't like the look of it. But let me put something else to you on it, right? If, and I'm just using numbers, plucking them out of the air, but just say you had after the next Doyle, Sinn Féin underperforms and only, against expectations and only has about 55 seats. And Fianna Fáil maybe has overperforms and has about 45 seats. That Fianna Fáil might be more willing to go into a coalition on a near equality basis rather than say Sinn Féin is 70 seats, Fianna Fáil is 30 seats. Clever guys and women in Fianna Fáil mm. would be saying, geez, do we really want to be mm. a 30% partner in a coalition with Sinn Féin? Will we not get eaten alive? That's a very valid point. And when I speak to old timers, soldiers of destiny and Cummins and so on, they say to me, well, OK, Ivan, if... Fianna Fáil do that on the basis of, say, 60, 30 TDs or something like that to get a 90 uh, seat majority. It'll be the end of Fianna Fáil because they'll be a mudguard, they lose their identity. Whereas I actually think two things. One is the choice facing the next government choice is do you want Sinn Féin and a really radical left wing government that will spook the horses, that will drive wealthy people out of the country? Or do you want some some handbrake on that? Therefore, vote Fianna Fáil because we can dispense a role here. Do you see Mary Lou MacDonald, who everyone believes is almost certain to be the next Taoiseach, running a government with the likes of Richard Boyd Barrett and Paul Murphy in it? Oh, I think whatever Mary Lou has to do to be Taoiseach, she'll go, she'll go with you, she'll go with me, she'll go with anyone. I mean, like, uh, sorry, she, 
This 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 killer instinct, this tunnel vision, this ruthlessness. You're admiring of that trait. Yeah, no, of no, hers. but no. When we get onto her, she is. We are complete, now. We're, we're okay. now. We're she's completely her. untested. She she's never been a minister, right? She like whatever appraisal you do of Leo for Taoiseach, Michal for Taoiseach, I think they're credible candidates. The question for, for, for Mary Lou is, how would she handle a party of 60? How would she keep them together? There would be all sorts of head the balls perhaps elected in a wave. Uh, that's the first issue. Secondly, is what is the structure in Sinn Féin? Is it the Ard Corlea? Is it a cabal in West Belfast? It's a, I don't know is the answer to that question. But the truth of it is that she's going to have to clarify all those issues. She's going to have to deal with the civil servants. She has no experience of dealing with the civil servants. She has a very... And the party have a very difficult relationship with the media that will need to change. And and so therefore, uh, I think it, it is a big question mark about Mary Lou. Right, yes, she ticks the three key boxes you want. If you were to say to me, Ivan, brand image, give me the next Taoiseach of this country. Female, Dublin, feisty you know, inequality and fighting that. She takes all the boxes if you were an image consultant that you would want. Okay, in... <laughs> Doing some publicity for this podcast, Path to Power, we've been doing various interviews and an interesting question came up in one of the interviews we were doing with Larissa Nolan in relation to Mary Lou MacDonald's approach to immigrants. And it was very interesting that you said you almost admired the incredible 180 degree turn she has done in relation to immigrants. Whereas you found it a bit, I actually was actually from quite your shocked. woke perspective, you found it uh, totally horrifying. unacceptable. The first unacceptable. 20 you, you were horrified that someone could say no to more migration. No, that's not what I was horrified <laughs> by because I think that's it's much more nuanced than that. What I was quite taken aback by was that. Sinn Féin and Mary Lou Macdonald have gone from a position of being supportive of immigrants coming in, which was something which I thought was to their credit because there might have been a perception that, look, ourselves alone, Sinn Féin's brand was xenophobic, let's get the British out, and that it had matured and changed, welcoming people coming from all over the world into Ireland. To the extent that last year as well, Sinn Féin was saying that international protection applicants should be getting the same money as the Ukrainians. So we went from that, not to saying, OK, look, we need to put a cap on the amount of new people coming in, but going to say that come March 2025, if these Ukrainians can't prove that they fulfil essential roles in our economy as workers, that they would be deported. So what are we going to do? Are we going to start sending women and children and men back to war-torn Ukraine, which has still been bombarded by the Russians, where the Russians might still be in control of 20% of the country and worse, that we would actually say, Matt, well, we've had, a, we've had enough of you we're and we're about. sending you back. No, no, sir, this is politics. The situation has been considerable slippage uh, in Sinn Féin support from the mid-30s to the high-20s. Uh, significant. And the migration issue is always difficult because it's in inner city working class areas where they're feeling the, the, the worst impact of uh, a lot of migrants and where the most anti-migrant sentiment is and they are Sinn Féin voters. So they have been facing this difficulty and then with the emergence of different circumstances they've been on the wrong side of that debate for that constituency. So, Sorry, and I'm just going to come in yeah. here because I think it is clear, isn't it, that when Sinn Féin was polling the low to mid 30s in the opinion polls, that it wasn't necessarily because all of those who were saying they were going to vote for Sinn Féin wanted a united Ireland or believed in some of the things. Or believed were, housing would be solved under Yeah, under yeah. Sinn Féin. It was basically an anti-establishment, anti-government thing. But that if those people who were against the government feel that Sinn Féin were maintaining the same position in relation to immigration, there was no reason for them to support Sinn Féin. They would go and support independents or others who might Absolutely. be taking those positions. So that is what I can understand why she was trying to address. And Give there the are, people what they yeah, want. But hold it's on, a very simple hold game. On. There's a question about giving the people what they want and also been sensible about what you say because you can have a discussion I believe about are we in a situation I don't where think we, you're electable Matt I, I would have no <laughs> desire to ever be electable no desire whatsoever but sorry the point I was about to make is right we can have the discussion about whether we're providing enough for more people coming in because I'd use the analogy that you know if you invite somebody into your house 
you don't invite them to the house and then tell them you've no bedroom for them, but we've pitched a tent for you in the back garden and you can go out there. And we have a major issue that if we haven't been able to solve the provision of accommodation for people coming to the country, even if it's temporarily or not, we have to look and say, well, look, can we deal with more than 100,000 Ukrainians and others? That is a logical thing to say for more people coming in. But you can't turn around and suddenly start saying, well, those who have come in, we'll get rid of you and we'll send you back to Ukraine, no, even if credible. the war is still raging. It's not credible. And and the change in benefits and the, the government situation about the 90 days all indicate those underlying realities of uh, capacity. I'm sorry, are they an Irish solution to an Irish problem in the sense that rather than being honest and saying, we're not taking any more, we just put up all these sort of hurdles to mm. try and make it more difficult for mm. people to come in. Do as I say or do as I do. is the, yeah. is the But no, can I say this? If you observe politics in all democracies, decades in, decades out, you know, Tony Blair had the change zeitgeist, there'd been so many years of Tory rule. Obama, change you can believe in. The biggest, most potent factor So is change. And, and what I'm trying to say to you is this. In all of these discussions about Leo, Mihal, and Mary Lou, it's actually the hand of cards you're dealt with. I felt Garrett was before his time on some of the issues that were deeply unpopular that became, you know, consensual issues. And I think that she also ticks the box of the change zeitgeist. Her whole language is really anti the boomer generation, is anti the establishment and say, you know, not only do I want to get power, but I want to get both of the establishment parties out. That rhetoric is all built on the change zeitgeist. Okay, but and, and I think that works. Is the thing as strong as you believe? Because I'll give you one example. Keir Stammer okay. is the same. Okay, but I'll give you one example from here in Ireland in the 21st century. And it's going back a little bit, but there was this pitch for change in the 2007 election exacerbated by Bertie Ahern's financial misdealings, which were becoming a major issue. And what actually happened was the Irish people opted not to have change because they were afraid of change. Now, as it turns out, the economy tanked anyway, and then they blamed Fianna Fáil for it and did turf the majority of them out. Although when you think about it as well, they never finished off Fianna Fáil. They yeah, let well, Fianna Fáil is, I, I come think, back I it. think in all honesty, uh, yes, the portents of economic change were happening. The recessionary winds were starting to blow. I think there was a, a you know, the devil you know or the devil you know. I think there was a, a question mark about Enda Kenny being Taoiseach, you know, whether he had the economic or capacity to do it, which he actually proved uh, a doubter's wrong. But I would say that at the end of the day, this is completely different because this is driven by demographics. This is driven by younger people who believe everywhere that the system has screwed them over and excluded them. OK, but does that necessarily mean they'll go to Sinn Féin, right? Because who else will they go to? Well, this is a left field one. Gary Murphy, professor of yeah. politics in DCU. You like on? the academic types, I know. Uh, Gary's a practical, never, ne, ne, practical never put their man. name on a ballot paper, but go Ga on. Yeah. Gary's a practical man. He's a nice man. guy, yeah. Gary, he's a good corkman <laughs> yeah. too. Yes, I know, all right? I know. Gary says something very interesting the other night on The Last Word to me, which sort of took me as a surprise. He suggested that perhaps the polls are underestimating the support the Greens will get, particularly from young people. That young people, despite, as he pithily put it himself, their willingness to head off on flights on holidays and to get their clothes sent in from China cheaply, that they actually are interested in the Green agenda and they might vote that way. Yeah, I, 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 I you think, don't see it. No, no, what I see is absolutely that the the the, the Greta factor is is going to be a permanent change. The green issue, sustainability, the climate change is bigger than the Green Party. In other words, it, it, people yeah. thought in business, oh, if we burn an effigy of Eamon Ryan, you know, we won't have this change in agriculture or motoring or whatever. Bullshit. The fact of the matter is this train is leaving the station and for the next five governments, this is going to be on the agenda. Well, exactly. I was going to say, that's something I think we might discuss in either episode three or episode four, that even if the Greens were to be wiped out in the next general election... Europe is driving this. It would still be... Very much. Like you look at all the new happen, directives yeah. coming in on sustainable finance, uh, you know, in terms of Article 8 and Article 9. We're talking about uh, the new uh, sustainability reporting directive and so on, corporate level. All of these changes are coming whether, whoever's in okay, Marion Street. But could it be that when we get to the general election, and even might be a little bit of this in local and European elections, although I think it'll be less because I suspect that's going to be about immigration in particular. But when we get to the general election, that the what we call the establishment parties will be saying we have to manage whatever change, that it has to come dropping slowly, that we can't risk 
the recovery of the last decade, and I know they won't want to use the phrase keep the recovery going, mm. but we're at a record number of jobs, we're at record corporation tax receipts, there is more money to do things. As the government will argue, don't put that at risk by giving it to Sinn Féin, who might indulge in policies which will put an awful lot of that prosperity at risk. And for all the people, I know that people say it hasn't been shared, the prosperity, and I can understand that. There are We still are actually probably in a much better place than we ever could have considered we would be in if you look back as far as 2011. That is factually absolutely correct. And you know what? If this change zeitgeist happens, it could actually result in worse government, worse public finances. So I'm actually uh, very open to the fact that people are going to throw the baby in the bathwater out. But there is one other thing that I would ask you to look at. If you look at European politics, take Greece, take Italy, take France... All the establishment parties have got, you know, Macron's election yep. was new, shiny, change, zeitgeist, all of that kind of thing. So this is not just an Irish phenomenon that the civil war parties are, you know, in peril. Well, then just a couple of things to finish up this episode of Path to the Power, which you can get wherever it is you get your, your podcasts. And please remember to subscribe so that the next edition comes up automatically and send a link to your friends as well, please, if you get the opportunity. But the last couple of things in relation to this, you asked about Mary Lou MacDonald's suitability to be Taoiseach, as in it'll be a test of her, her temperament, her health, a, all these a issues. lot of things that she hasn't had because she's never held ministerial office. How much of a problem is it going to be that a lot of people are now starting to focus on the depth beneath her? That is it six or seven prominent people in Sinn Fein who do all the media appearances, but of those who would be elected rather than backroom people, what sort of strength and depth do they have? Or well, does for, it matter? First of all, speaking to some constituency TDs, existing incumbents, they're actually looking over their shoulder and say, you know, I don't have the support of head, head office. If we only get one seat in this constituency, it's not mine if, if headquarters had their way. So there is a, 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 a going to be an emergence of new people who will get in in the local elections that we don't know of right now. But Pierce Doherty, Owen O'Brien, Louise O'Reilly, uh, David Cullinan. And it actually suits them to keep it as tight as that with Mary Lou. And, and, and the truth is, like, what's happened to Imelda Munster? Why isn't she standing in the next election? She did quite well at the PAC over the RTE issue. Uh, I think there'll be lots more to delve into there. OK, but are you taking it that you would expect, as things stand here in our first episode of 2024, that when we get to the end of 2024, we will be talking about Mary Lou Macdonald's first month's as Taoiseach? What I've tried to do is do a SWOT analysis of the three individuals. What I'm saying is the circumstances of age, journey, time in office, change, all the circumstances. Doesn't mean Mary Lou is better than them. She has got the most propitious, opportunistic circumstance. That she is playing with the wind, the others are playing against the wind. Okay, thank you, Ivan. You've been listening to Path to Power with me, Matt Cooper and Ivan Yates. This edition has only cost Ivan 20 euro. <laughs> Just to explain, there is a... We have put in place a swear jar and it's not for the F word, but it's for the woke word. And you only called me woke once today. <laughs> Very so that's, justified. That's though. an additional 20 euro that's going into the pot, which will be used for an end of series bet. And uh, we, the winnings from that bet will then be given to charity. We hope you've enjoyed it. We have lots to talk about every week and um, we've lots to talk about I've already got things in mind for the next two weeks while we're waiting for the business to resume in the door actually can you get over this I mean the holidays they get isn't it ridiculous uh, I, we're look, back at work I'm back on the radio sorry, sorry right Matt now. these people can lose their jobs in six months time in eight months have you time. not no, you've worked to broadcast no, 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 we no, can no, lose our jobs well, a lot more quickly no, the, than the, that the point I'm making is they're working in their constituencies doing the most important thing getting re-elected <laughs> good evening or goodbye or whatever it is thanks for listening <laughs>